We're going to spend a, a little while looking in Jeremiah. We're going to uh, not read the, uh, the whole chapter, we're going to read little chunks as we go along. Uh, Jeremiah is a prophet. Uh, a prophet is a person who speaks on behalf of God to the people of God. Or he might get sent to people who are not the people of God, but he, like a priest does it the other way around, he comes from the people to God. It's often doing work in that way, but a prophet's going the other way, he's coming from God with a word for God to people. And pro- uh, Jeremiah's a prophet in difficult days. There is political upheaval. Uh, in Jeremiah's time, there was a King Manasseh. And now if you read through the book of Kings, you find that you have a king turn up and he was the most evil king until the next king turns up and he was the most evil king. And then the next king, he was even more evil than all the other kings. And that's how it went. So there's King Manasseh who was really evil and his son Anon was even more evil. But then there's a change and uh, Josiah becomes king and he was not evil but he actually honoured God. The evil that he lived through, though, in Jeremiah, like our day, there was child sacrifice. Um, And so they sacrificed to God Molech, and how there are sacrifices for children in our today, it isn't there. The law of God was, not that it was disobeyed, it was disregarded. They didn't even know it to to disobey it. That's very similar to where we are as a society, aren't we, in that way. It's disregarded, not disobeyed. Everything in Jeremiah's day seemed helpless and here we have him with bringing the same message that as you go through the prophets all the prophets really bring a message of of repentance and it's the same message which we bring as the church isn't it to our nation a message of repent turn or face judgment same message that jeremiah speaks in his day is the message that we have today Remember, uh, do you remember before lockdown, we, the, the, the Sunday before lockdown? You don't remember it? You actually were in South Africa. Um, that's why you don't remember it. Um, and it was Micah's dedication. Do you remember that? Micah's dedication. And I preached on the book of Micah as another prophet. And in the book of Micah, there's this drumbeat. Judgment is coming. And I did a... You know, judgment is coming. That was the, the drumbeat of Micah, the drumbeat of the prophet. Judgment is coming. That's the drumbeat of all the prophets, it seems. There's a judgment coming. But wait, you've got a moment here before judgment comes to turn to God. And Jeremiah's message is very similar. So we're going to start in chapter 2 and read from verse 5 to 8 to start with. Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me? Talking about himself, God speaking. Um, that they have gone far from me, gone far from God, have followed idols and have become idolaters. Neither did they say, where is the Lord? Or who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? Who led us through the wilderness, through a land of desert and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt? I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness, but you have entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handled the law, as the teachers, did not know me. The rulers, like kings, also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after the things that do not profit. There was a failure in leadership. This is what verse 8 is telling us, isn't it? Failure in leadership. We've got the priest didn't ask, where is the Lord? The teachers, those who handle the Lord, didn't know God. The rulers sinned against God. The prophets prophesied by Baal, a false god. And before that, we have the people asking, the people didn't ask. But if the leadership, the leaders aren't asking those questions, the leaders aren't leading in a godly way, we can't expect the people to follow in such a way either. They didn't ask the questions. That's what bad leadership does. It doesn't ask the questions. Where is the Lord in this, is the question they should have been asking. Because the flow, the direction of society... It flows away from God, doesn't it? Sin flows away from the things of God. As we looked at this morning, if you listened online, uh, that we get handed over to sin and, and, and just sin just rolls on down the river, doesn't it? It keeps taking us darker and darker and worse and worse. And so leadership has to ask the question, keep asking questions, say, what's going on here? Where are we leading? Where are we going? What's going on? Where is God in all this? 
The people wandered from God and they didn't ask where is God, they just carried on with their sin. Sin consumed them. Now we can see that there's a failure in leadership in our society, can't we? We don't have to point at personalities or characters or name people, but the reality is that we've divorced character and integrity and principles from leadership, haven't we? We've made the leadership more about like a, maybe a skill base or a competence level, but actually character and godliness and integrity, they are the important things in leadership. And that is flowed into the church as well, isn't it? It's not just the leadership of nations, but the leadership of the church as well has this, has this problem. And we find moral failings in the church leadership again and again and again. Mike has just written a blog, haven't you, just this last week, on uh, how we can be helped when we uh, find, we come against like failures in leadership. So do read that. But often it happens at the end of people's ministry. Uh, Solomon, when did he muck up? At the end. Gideon, when did he muck up? At the end. David, when did he muck up? At the end. Maybe they all thought their job was done. Maybe they thought that God had given them all they needed to do. They'd done it. Now they could have some time for themselves. So, all you people who consider yourself old, watch out. <laughs> watch out that you don't think I've done my job now. I can relax. Because if you relax, where does the river flow? Yeah, away from the Lord. So there's a failure in leadership. Uh, and then verse 11 to, to verse 13 of, of chapter 2. Has a nation changed its gods which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have made for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that hold no water. So the two sins that the people have committed is they've rejected the fountain of living water. Imagine that you had a fountain outside your house or a well. You go, hey, that's where you got your water from. There's living water, clean water. You can go from your, your well or your fountain. That's living water. It's flowing. But they've rejected that and they've gone for cisterns that do not hold, even, hold water. What would happen with cracked, broken cisterns that don't hold water? What would they be filled with? Sludge, isn't it, I guess, isn't it? Like the muddy, dirty residue after the water has gone. So they've gone and taken themselves away from the living God and made for themselves, it says again, made for themselves. They made their own gods instead of going after the true and living God. Romans tells us that they exchanged the glory of God for created things. But the source of all life is God. But people prefer the things of life to the source of all life. So what are the gods of our age? Here we have uh, Baal who they followed and uh, maybe different reasons why they followed Baal. But in our day and age, people aren't following Baal, are they? What are the gods of today's age? If people are rejecting the living God, the source of all life, what systems are people making today? Well, there's the typical ones that probably work throughout all generations. There's health, isn't there? That's probably the uh, one that's, you know, we see that lifted high every day at the moment, don't we? People's health. Uh, people say things like, as long as you've got your health, well, there's, there's your God. Uh, another one is wealth, isn't he? That's, what basically, that's, 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 that's basically Boris Johnson at the moment, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> He's saying, isn't he? Um, save lives and protect the economy. There's his, the two gods, aren't they? Health and wealth. And he's just identifying they're the most important things for us as a society. That's what he's preaching. Um, but there's other gods in, in, in our society as well. Uh, there's a book I haven't read. I prefer to read people's interviews on their books than, <laughs> than read their books. And maybe because I'm lazy. Anyway, uh, there's a, book, a guy called Douglas Murray, and he wrote, wrote a book called The Madness of Crowds. You know, that's basically you know, everyone's going along with it, what everyone else is going along with because it's easier. Um, and, and in that, he said that um, how our, our society is creating new gods, but he prefers the old gods. So the new gods are gods of equality and social justice. So if you watch the news or hear things about going, there you can see that those are gods lifted high, aren't they? And because they're gods, 
you can't profane their name. You just bring out the God and everything else has to be silent around it. So social justice and equality are the gods of our day along with health and wealth. And we have to be careful that in the name of equality we could easily create racism and in the name of Freedom, we can create slaves, can't we? Sexual wise, we can think of sexual freedom that people are liberating, but actually it's making slaves, isn't it? Uh, so we can see that these gods, because they're not the living God, they will actually entrap people, they'll ensnare people. The biggest problem, though, he, he, this guy was saying with, with today's gods is they only provide guilt, they don't give any redemption. So the cry for uh, uh, different things about equality and about social justice and health and wealth, they put burdens on us, but there's no forgiveness, there's no redemption, is there? There's no hope. So this was happening in Jeremiah's day, it happens in our day, people reject the living God and make their own gods. Then it goes on to say these words, which is the prophet's message and often the prophet's, different prophet's message. Be horribly afraid. Be very desolate. So there's a, a fear and a judgment to come. And we find that coming up in verse 19 uh, to 20 of chapter 2. For your own wickedness will correct you, and your backsliding will rebuke you. So people's own sin and own gods will come and punish them themselves. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing. That you have forsaken the Lord your God, and the fear of me, the fear of God, is not in you, says the Lord of hosts. For I've, of old I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds, and you said, I will not transgress on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down and play the harlot. God speaking to his people and he's saying, you are like stubborn animals. Um, I don't know if you've ever uh, had a dog or an animal where you try and train, the, train it, or a horse, you know. Now, animals uh, are stubborn, aren't they? But also, they're very different in different contexts. So, our dog, we can get him to sit for his... We don't even have to use treats, we just use his dog food. He's, he's just happy enough with that. <laughs> anyway, he sits for his food and he does it, he lays down for his food, does a paw for his food. Now, it's like this dog is saying, what's this verse say here? It says, uh, um, You said, I will not transgress. Our dog, Max, Maxie, he says, I will not transgress. <laughs> he, he, I will sit for my food. <laughs> I will he'll run around in circles for a piece of, you know, food. He'll keep, he'll even do it when you haven't got any food in the house. Here you go, fine. We take our dog to the park. We have some food in our pocket. He's just sniffing around over there, sniffing where another dog's been. There goes another dog, off he goes. He's not really interested in the treat so much. He's not interested. He likes tennis balls and he likes other dogs. It, that I will not transgress has become I will transgress. And stubborn animals, that's what the Bible is telling us we are like. We are like that. When we're in the place of worship, when we're in that place before the Lord, we say, oh Lord, I will not transgress, I will not sin, you are my God. But get us in a field where there's other things we can sniff at and chase at, and we're running after them. It seems hopeless, doesn't it? It seems hopeless. Godless seems a message of judgment. Does the prophets often seem like that? They seem a message of judgment. But there are rays of hope that keep shining through. So here we come to uh, chapter 3, verse 22. For though... Oh no, that's chapter 2. Chapter 3, verse 22. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. There is hope. There is grace. There is forgiveness. But it starts with a return. You've got to turn and come back to the source of living water. 
You've got to come and back to the fountain and the source of life. You've got to come back to God. You've got to return. As we come and we return, then I will heal your backsliding. Sin wrecks our lives. It does. Ruins our lives. Here the Lord says, return and you're backsliding, you're turning away from me, which is sin. Return and I will heal your backsliding. Our God is a God who when we come in repentance, when we turn to him, he comes and he heals us. Grace and provision in the God in whom we've snubbed is found. If we move along to chapter 4 and verse 1 to 4. If you return to me, O Israel, says the Lord, turn to me, and if you put away your abominities out of my sight, turn and remove away from your sin, get rid of your own gods, follow me, then you shall not be moved. And you shall swear the Lord lives in truth, in judgment and in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and do not sow among the thorns. Circumcise yourselves, take away the foreskin from your hearts. You men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, let my fury come forth like Less, sorry, my fury come forth like fire and burn that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. This is the moment in history we are in. It's the moment of the call to repentance. There is coming a fiery judgment and here we have grace on offer, a day of grace, a day of salvation that is open to you and to the nations. And it's in Jesus. Can you see Jesus here? The Lord lives. You shall swear the Lord lives. Jesus is alive. Some people think about Christianity, actually that they like Jesus. Well, if God was like Jesus, Christianity does seem okay. But the news is better than that. Jesus is God. And he was God who made himself flesh and came among us and lived for us, lived the righteousness that we can have. And as we return to him, the resurrection and the life, we can know forgiveness and no condemnation. The Lord lives and as this passage says, he is the truth and the life. See that it says here, it says in uh, verse uh, 2, the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, in righteousness. This is, I am the way, the truth and the life. This is Jesus. And then it goes on to say, the nations shall bless themselves in him. He is the source of our blessing. He is the, the source of, of our hope. He is the source of our joy. It's only in Christ. Um, Abraham made a, a prophecy, didn't he? Well, sorry, Abraham was given a prophecy that all nations will be blessed through him. And here is Jesus, the fulfilment of this Abrahamic promise that the nations are going to be blessed through Jesus. In him they shall glory. All seems hopeless. All seems like there is just no hope. But there is hope in the name of Jesus. As we turn to him, as we repent from our sins, as we take a look at our lives and we ask the question, where is the Lord? Are we chasing false gods? Are we after foreign gods? Are we after the world's gods of health and wealth? Or are you making Jesus your God? Because Jesus is God and he is the only hope in this world. Let's pray, shall we? Let's turn our eyes and our hearts and our minds to him. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you know who is yours and we know uh, who is God. Lord, thank you that you are the king who says, turn to me now while there's time, repent, re turn away from these false gods and turn towards the living God. Thank you that we're under the sound uh, of the gospel. Thank you that you know and love and cherish all of us, Lord. But you call all of us to repent. You call all of us to turn to you, to turn to the living God. And Lord, would we heed this call? We pray for our community. Lord, we pray for these lives that are represented out by this window and we pray you'd have mercy on them. 
Lord, that they would know that there is a God and that they will meet him one day. And Lord, we pray you'd put the fear of God into hearts and minds and even little young ones, we pray, that they might have an awe and a sense of awe that there is a God, that they will have to give an account for their lives before him. And he says, turn to me or face the judgment fire. Lord, we don't say it with any pleasure, but we know there is a coming judgment. And as we fall at the start, Lord, and you are our refuge. You're our protection. You're our fortress. Jesus, only in you can we find peace, can we find protection from coming judgment. So hide us in you, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.